Hey, we're so excited that you're here with us, and a very Merry Christmas to each and every one of you. Would you just stand up wherever you're at? Will you find someone that you know, maybe someone you don't know, and just say good morning. Tell them how happy you are that they're here. continue to sing we just remember man there's no one like our God he is worthy to be praised so I just encourage you just continue to lift your voice continue to lift your hands as we praise a great God who's worthy of every song blessed are those who run to him but place the hope and confidence in Jesus he won't forsake them 
blessed to also see his face Who bend the knee and fix the gaze on Jesus They won't be shaken So come on and pray Bless God in the darkest valley 
justice, your mercy, revival in our city. We you are Lord of everything 
And so we just bless your name in this place, regardless of what we're going through right now. We just want to say that you are worthy because of your great love, because of your great love. We just want to say that we love you too. It's your name, Jesus, that we do all these things. And everyone said, amen. You guys are welcome to take a seat. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Trust you all had just a great Thanksgiving and uh, you got all your Christmas shopping done already, right? Yeah, some of you do, yeah. I, uh, I'm not a, a big Black Friday guy, but uh, yesterday morning I was home alone and, uh, and I had the computer open. I jumped onto Amazon for some reason and, uh, you know, Black Friday specials were all out there. And so I've got, uh, I've got one daughter that's making a huge move in her life uh, come May. And so I thought, you know what, just, you know, and it's just right there in front of me. It was, everything was right there in front of me. I thought I need to get that, 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 and that. So I got her done in like five minutes, you know, it's all taken care of. And she didn't even ask for any of it. And uh, it's just going to be fun to show her that this is what you need because of the decision you're making. So it's all good. Hey, this is a really special weekend for us here at Pathway. I know some of you are here as guests today and so glad that you're with us this morning. Uh, you know, I met a new friend. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to embarrass him, but I met a new friend this morning. And, uh, and he told me that this was the... Uh, the fifth time he's been in church, and uh, the first time he came to church five weeks ago was the first time he had been in church in over 30 years. And uh, so, you know, I think that's an awesome thing, don't you? I think just, uh, yeah, it's really, really great. That's what we're all about. And, uh, you know, someone uh, invited him, and, uh, and we come into the season of Christmas when actually this is a time of year when, when your ones, those that you're building relationship with, would actually probably come into a church service and be a part of, be a part of this place. Uh, maybe for one service. You, never, never, you don't have any idea how that one could turn into to multiple and then into the point of life change. And uh, it's a gift you can give. And that's what this season's all about, is giving really great gifts. Last week was Compassion Weekend. Uh, just another great weekend for us as a church. We have this mission in Tanzania, this project we've been doing for the past couple of years there with the church and the learning center and the community. And uh, a few years ago, uh, there was over 600 kids that were sponsored. And uh, I think about 450 of those have been maintained and Compassion's made sure that the rest of them have been taken care of as well. Last weekend, uh, our hope was 300 kids, 300 more kids. And uh, you did 278 kids last weekend, which is awesome. That's 754 so far for us as a church within that region. That means a lot of kids that are being taken out of poverty, a lot of families, a lot of generations changed. Uh, Todd Turk's going to be out in the lobby uh, at his table, Compassion Table. Maybe you missed the opportunity. You want to pick one of those up. I think we have about six or eight kids from within that little area in Tanzania, that, that particular project that have yet to be sponsored. So they're out there as well if you want to pick one of those up this morning. Can't pick the child up, but you can pick the picture up, and uh, that'd be a great thing. Christmas Eve is coming up. Uh, again, a great time to invite people to, to church. Uh, Monday, 3 and 5. Tuesday, 1, 3 and 5. A lot of opportunity for you to serve, uh, both in our first impressions, which is our greeters and our ushers, as well as Kids City, which is always a, a major, major opportunity for us to serve the families that are coming on Christmas Eve. That is in your bulletin. Uh, as we walk towards the year end, uh, there's a Christmas giving tree out there that's for families in need within Pathway, and you, you just give and give and give so well to, to those families that are in need every year. It's, just, it's, an, it's a, just a real joy for me to watch all that take place. And then we talk about year end generosity. Inside your bulletin, there's some information on that, and we get towards the end of the year thinking about all the ways God has blessed us as a church. We want to give out of what God has done for us. We'll do that anyway through the year, through our missions and local missions and projects that come up as, as the year progresses that are unexpected. Uh, for the here, it's our benevolence piece, which is families in need. We've, been, we've given more this year than I think most years, and uh, the need is very strong. We're looking at doing some, some real little, little, little renovation projects around here as well, and uh, we're going to give you more on that as the year goes on next year. 
But then our local partnerships. Um, we're looking to launch this new ministry into the Allen County Jail through, um, through a ministry called God Behind Bars, and it's going to be awesome. We've got a great group of people that have come together for that. Uh, the Rescue Mission, uh, the Remedy Live, Youth for Christ, uh, local church partnerships. We've got two churches we've been partnering with in our city, uh, within our, um, our, our urban community, and we're excited about that. And then our global partners, which is our Home of Love. Not our home of love, but home of love in India, Chennai, India, and uh, looking to pick up a van for them so they can get the girls where they need to go, and uh, it's just going to be great. So uh, I'm going to ask those who are going to serve us this time to go ahead and come on down, and, uh, and let's pray together, shall we? Lord, thank you so much for just uh, the ultimate gift you gave to us uh, through, um, through that expression of your love to us when, Jesus, you came, and, and uh, God, you took on flesh, and you went to that cross to be that atoning sacrifice for our sins. And uh, you poured yourself out for us. And um, you became poor, as Corinthians says, so in many ways we could become rich. And uh, rich not in the sense of a prosperity perspective, but rich in the sense of your love, your grace, and the eternal hope that we have in Christ Jesus our Savior. And so we give back a portion of what you've given to us, and we give it in, in honor of all you've done for us. We give it because we want to remember that you're the one who gave it to us. And you, you're the one who's given us all things that we need. And, uh, and so, Lord, we will honor these gifts to be used for your glory and your honor. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, this is baptism weekend uh, this weekend. And uh, uh, we have uh, 39 baptisms this weekend. Yeah, it's been awesome. Um, and uh, there's some awesome stories with that that go along with it. Uh, matter of fact, uh, one of the baptisms this morning um, uh, is going to be baptized. Devin's going to be baptized this morning. And then he and Ashley, I'm going to do a wedding for them right after the second service, which is going to be kind of a cool thing. So, yeah. And then uh, I'm going to get done with that, and I'm going to baptize the whole family after that, which is going to be pretty awesome, too. Uh, but uh, baptism is really that moment when we get to identify with what Christ has done for us, uh, with the reality of the fact of Jesus Christ, um, both the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the fact that is, as we're told in, in, uh, in Corinthians that we have been given this new life, that the old is gone, the new has come, and, uh, and that, that really the commandment to, Jesus gave to his disciples was to go and make uh, disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And it's a beautiful picture of the gospel story. Uh, refers to this understanding of being buried with Christ, that Christ died and we are dead to sin through salvation, that Christ was buried and we are burying our old sinful life, and that Christ was raised, and that we are raised to a new life in Christ. Baptism is not for salvation. It is not for perfection. No one up here that's getting baptized is perfect. We're all in that journey, uh, aren't we? And, uh, and yet, it's an opportunity for us to remember the fact that it's not because of what I've done, but it's because of what Christ has done for me. I'm not saved by works. I'm saved by the work that Christ did for me upon that cross, that, that grace that's been extended to me. Now, there will be some of you here this morning that you may have some, some children, maybe, that are going up to be baptized, and, and you're thinking to yourself, well, wait a minute here. I did that for them when they were a child, when they were an infant. And I just want you to know that uh, this, this moment does not does not discount, but really fulfills your hopes for them. That when you baptize them, you baptize them with an understanding of what Christ had done for them, and uh, with the prayer and the hope that one day they would understand that fully. And really, what's happening here is that they're really, really celebrating the fact they fully understand all that Christ has done for them, and they are declaring their faith in Christ publicly as a result of that. It's kind of like Christmas time. Uh, if you're sitting around the Christmas tree and... Uh, and your, your son, Billy, is over here to, to your side, and Aunt Susie gives him a gift, and he opens it up, and he starts playing with it. What do you tell Billy to do? You say, go say thank you to Aunt Susie. So he walks over and says, thank you, Aunt Susie. He goes back playing with his gift. Now, why did he say thank you? Because you told him to. It's not hard, folks. This is really easy. Uh, but there comes a moment where Billy opens up the gift, gets up there later in life and he realizes the cost, he realizes the sacrifice, he realizes the thought, and he just walks over to Aunt Susie and says, thank you. Thank you, Aunt Susie. Well, that's what this time is. It's time to say thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for me. And, uh, and I want everyone to know that you are my Lord and my Savior and publicly declaring it through baptism. So a few moments, you're going to see the folks go down uh, into this area and the team's going to lead us in a song and 
uh, and there's going to be some words and expressions of their story on the screens, and uh, after they get baptized, feel free just to, just to celebrate with them. So.
Awesome. Let's, let's just kind of celebrate them one more time, shall we? It's really, really great. Yeah. What a, wow. What a great way to start out uh, this Advent season. And we're walking into a brand new series called Anticipation. Excited about this series uh, as we walk all the way through the end of the month. And, uh, and this morning, um, I've asked a friend to come and share. Steve was with us a few years ago, Steve Poe. Uh, he was the, uh, the former pastor at Northview Church in Indy. He actually took that church from a very small church to a significant church there in Indianapolis. And uh, I met Steve a number of years ago and just really began to develop a really good friendship with him. And, and since he's retired, which you never retire, uh, he's just begun to meet with other pastors throughout the country and uh, mentor and just kind of put his, his arm around them. And it's been awesome. I've been a recipient of that. He wrote a great book called Creatures of Habit, uh, which we use this in a series, which Steve spoke from a couple years ago. So in a few moments, Steve's going to come up. And uh, when he does come up, do me a favor and just let's give him a, a great, great pathway welcome as he kicks off our series on anticipation, talking about hope. Man, don't you just love baptisms? Oh, I love it. I, I used to tell our people that baptisms are, to a pastor, baptisms are kind of the reward for everything we do. It's just so awesome to see people take that step of faith. Well, Merry Christmas, Pathway. Hey, it's so good to be back with you guys again. I just, uh, I love all the exciting things that God is doing here in your church, and I love your pastor. He is the real deal. I can tell you that. <laughs> I'm absolutely honored uh, to be back with you guys again, and I'm honored to uh, have him as my friend. Thank you, Ron, for all you're doing up here in Fort Wayne. And um, I've, I don't know if you hear it in my voice, I just got over uh, the creeping crud. How many have been attacked by the creeping crud so far this year? And so I'm hoping and praying. I asked God this morning for a miracle. I said, Lord, I need to get through this. So I pray my voice will uh, hold out. I, uh, thinking about Christmas, I was thinking about the guy that wanted to do something special for his mother. And he said, I, I really want to do something extremely special. So he started to investigate what he could give, give his mom. And he found out uh, that this guy had some, two chickens that were, could dance and sing and talk but he wanted $5,000 a piece. And he said, you know what? I've got that much in my savings account, so I'll take them both. So he shipped these two chickens down to his mother. And a couple days later, he called his mom and he said, mom, did you get my present? And she said, oh, I did. They were so good. And he said, mom, you didn't eat the chickens. Well, yes, I ate the chickens. He said, they were special chickens. They could sing and dance and talk. And she said, well, they should have said something. <laughs> Let me pray, and we're going to jump right into this. Father, I thank you and I praise you for your faithfulness. And just thank you, God, for all that you're doing in this great church, and pray that your blessings and favor would continue to be upon it. I thank you, Lord, for Ron and his leadership, and pray, dear God, that you just continue to give him a bold vision to reach this community for Christ. And now, God, as we get into this, open up our eyes and ears to see and hear all that you want to do. Thanks, God. We love you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, guys, when you think about Christmas, what is one word or maybe even the first word that comes to your mind? Presence? Joy? Celebration? What is one word that comes to your mind? For my wife and I, it would be the word anticipation. We really do anticipate Christmas every year. My wife, probably more than me, she starts playing Christmas music. This year it was in September. And uh, she put our Christmas tree up on November 1st. So she truly uh, anticipates Christmas. So retailers certainly anticipate Christmas because for many of them, this season will determine whether they make a profit or loss. When there's little kids around, grandparents and parents anticipate Christmas. And of course, we know that children certainly anticipate Christmas. 
Guys, I also believe those that experienced that first Christmas did so with a great deal of anticipation. They were anticipating a light coming into our world that would bring us hope, love, joy, and peace, which as we now know would come through the gift of a Savior, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. So friends, during this Advent season, let's be intentional that we're going to embrace the true meaning of Christmas this year. Each week of this series, we're going to explore a different aspect of the Christmas season by using a backdrop of some of our favorite Christmas movies. Today, we're going to look at It's a Wonderful Life. I'm sure all of you have seen It's a Wonderful Life many, many times. The movie came out in 1946, and it stars Jimmy Stewart as George Bailey, who seems to have lost all hope and given up on his dreams. Watch this clip. What? The Bailey building alone was up there. They went out of business years ago. That thing is a liar! That's an inch violent thing! I know, I know that girl! Take a walk, feed it. What do you want? Mother, this. This is George. I, I thought sure you'd remember me. George, who? What, you, you, your brother in law, Uncle Billy. You know him? Well, sure I do. When did you see him last? Today, over at his house. It's a lie. He's been in the insane asylum ever since he lost his business. Are you sure this is Bailey Park? No, I'm not sure of anything anymore. But where are the houses? We went here to build them. Your brother, Harry Bailey, broke through the ice and was drowned at the age of nine. That's a lie. Harry Bailey went to war. He got the Congressional Medal of Honor. He saved the lives of every man on that transport. Every man on that transport died. Harry wasn't there to save them because you weren't there to save Harry. Mary. Mary. George, don't you know me? What's happened to us? I don't know. You let me go. Mary, please. Oh, don't do this to me. Please, Mary. Help me. Where's our kids? I need you, Mary. <coughs> Parents, I want to live again. Please, God, let me live again. So George is discouraged. He's ready to end his life. Then his guardian angel, Clarence. Not really the name I think of when I think of a guardian angel, but... That was his name. He shows up and he tries to encourage them and to instill hope into George's life by showing him all the different ways that he's touched so many people in this community and how life would have turned out very different if he had never been born. Even the town Bedford Falls is now called Potterville, and it's now full of nightclubs and pawn shops. Bailey Park, well, it was never built. Uncle Billy, well, he's been in a mental institute for many years. His brother Harry, He's dead because George was not there to save him from drowning. His wife, Mary, she's a lonely librarian. Guys, the point of the movie is how the world would have been a very different place if George Bailey had never been born. Well, it's certainly a wonderful story, which is why it's become a classic. It reminds us that God wants to use each and every one of us to bless other people at every opportunity. And that, of course, should give us hope, hope that our life is, in fact, worth living. But I have to admit, it caused me to pause. It caused me to think, what if Jesus had never been born? Try to imagine how different our lives would be, how different our world would be. You know, every year since 1927, Time Magazine puts on its front cover the person of the year. In that very first year, it was aviator Charles Lindbergh. In, 19, or in 2023, it was Taylor Swift. And yet, let me state the obvious, if I might. Just because your face is on the cover of a magazine does not measure greatness or value of life. In fact, I'm sure there's a lot of you in this room who are amazing at serving other people and blessing other people, either in the community or here at church. 
And I can tell you that if I had a vote, I'd nominate you for person of the year. You know, when someone dies, their impact or influence on the world slowly begins to fade. And I heard one guy describe it this way. He said, you know, 20 years ago, our world had Bob Hope, Johnny Cash, and Steve Jobs. Today, we have no jobs, no cash, and no hope. But seriously, guys, what if you could only choose, think about this for just a minute, if you will. What if you could only choose one person that's had the biggest impact or the greatest influence on our world? Wouldn't you have to agree there's actually only one name that can possibly work, and that's the name of Jesus? Because if you think about it, his impact was greater a hundred years after his death than during his life. In fact, after a thousand years, his legacy laid the foundation for much of Europe. And now after 2,000 years, he has more followers in more places than ever before. John Orberg wrote a book, Who Is This Man? And in this book, he asked the same question that we're asking this morning. How different would our world be if Jesus had never been born? And this is what he writes. Jesus' vision of life continues to haunt and challenge humanity. His influence has swept over history like the tail of a comet, bringing his inspiration to art, science, government, medicine, and education. He has taught humans about dignity, compassion, forgiveness, and hope. His impact on the world is immense and non-accidental. It is in Jesus' name that desperate people pray, grateful people worship, and angry people swear. From christenings to weddings to sick rooms to funerals, it is in Jesus' name that people are hatched, matched, patched, and dispatched. From the dark ages to postmodernity, he is the man who won't go away. I absolutely love that. Isn't that good? Listen, the impact of Jesus is so great that 2,024 years after his birth, it's still the most widely celebrated birthday in all the world. And the cross is the most recognizable symbol in all the world. It marks graves, it adorns jewelries, it sits on top of churches, and most likely it's the uh, most common tattoo. And yet Jesus was born in a stable in the middle of cow poop. He grew up learning to be a carpenter, a hardworking blue collar kind of guy. Think about it, friends. He never held an office. He had no political clout whatsoever. His little band of followers were these uneducated, unimportant, and unwanted bunch of guys. He never led any kind of military action. He never wrote a bestseller. He didn't have 10 million followers on X. He never had a reality show. He never held a press conference. And yet, guys, it's impossible to imagine a world without Jesus. Think about it. When you got up this morning, it was December 1st, 2024. In other words, 2,024 years from the birth of Jesus, 2,024 years from the birth of this man we call Jesus. You can't even turn on, guys, think about it. You can't even turn on your iPhone, open a newspaper, or look at the expiration date on a gallon of milk without being reminded of who it is that split time in two. We don't divide history by before or after social media. We don't divide history by before or after Taylor Swift, but we do number our days and our years, BC before Christ and AD, Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. So again, I want you to understand the most pivotal event in history by far is the birth of Jesus. It's huge. Again, no one else splits time. In the book of Revelation, we know that the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus to John on the Isle of Patmos. And the book is, is a book to, that's intended to be an encouragement to us all. And it talks about what was, what is, and what's to come. And in Revelation chapter 17, he says, there are also seven kings, five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for only a little while. The beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven is going to his destruction. The 10 horns you saw are 10 kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war against the lamb, but the lamb will triumph over them because he is Lord 
He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Listen, in, when he writes this, he's not just being poetic. He's making a profound statement. He's writing into a world that was ruled by the Roman Empire, and he's saying, these kings have nothing over our King Jesus. Take Nero, take Augustus, take Tiberius or Julius Caesar. In fact, my friends, you can take all the rulers who have ever ruled, Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, King Edward, King James, LeBron James, it really doesn't matter. You can take all the kings that have ever existed before and ever will exist and put them in a group together and you will still find that Jesus is supreme over them all. Remember, he's making this claim in the first century when he only had a few thousand followers. But today, 2,000 years later, we name our children Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and we name our dogs Caesar and Nero. Oh, and by the way, Do you know when Nero died? In the year of our Lord, A.D. 68. Joseph Stalin, in the year of our Lord, A.D. 1953. Every ruler, every king, every dictator, every president that has ever lived or ever will live is dated now in reference to the life of this King Jesus. And then think about the words he spoke. You know, in the academic world, scholars kind of keep score by how often an article is cited by other scholars. Well, if we use that as our criteria, Jesus kind of blows everybody out of the water. His words are the most quoted, contested, analyzed, repeated, retweeted in all human history. And then think about teachers for a minute. They are simply dispensing information. But Jesus, on the other hand, was redefining commandments. Do you remember... Uh, the Sermon on the Mount, he stood on that hillside, and as he spoke to the masses that had gathered that day, he wasn't just, he, he wasn't dispensing information, he was literally redefining the commandments. He said, you have heard it said before, but now I say to you. In other words, this is the way it was, but now I'm redefining it. And so what he was doing is he was raising the bar for us as believers, as followers of Christ on our expectations. The words of Jesus penetrated their hearts, which is why people would literally travel from miles around to hear him teach, because his words were life-giving and hope-filled. Listen, the record we have of his teachings, of course, is the Word of God, the Bible, and the Gospels, certainly, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Word of God has had such an impact on our world. It's been translated into 3,658 different languages. You say, well, is that a lot? Oh, that's a lot. The second most translated book is one called The Little Prince of Antoine de saint Expurpere. It's the second most translated book, and it's been translated 382 times. That should speak volumes about how important the Word of God is to mankind. Guys, in the fourth century, before the invention of printing press, the followers of Jesus or monks devoted themselves to copying these ancient manuscripts day after day, month after month, and year after year. They wanted everyone to learn and to hear about the good news of Jesus. And eventually, Christians started to provide education by building schools and universities such as Oxford and Cambridge. Then there was Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and many others. Do you realize that all of these schools were started out of the Jesus movement? In fact, 92% of the first 138 colleges and universities in the United States were started by followers of Jesus. It's true. And it was Christian missionaries who compiled the first dictionaries and established the first schools so that every child could learn to read and to write and to know about this man, Jesus. Many of these missionaries left their families and home to take the good news to unreached people groups. Some actually lost their lives for the sake of the gospel. By the way, did you know that hospitals are a Christian invention? That's right, by the fourth century, newly Christianized Romans began running homes for the sick and needy. By the eighth century, the functions of the Christian hospitals or hospices were highly specialized. And then I'm sure you know how Jesus has impacted the art world throughout the centuries from painting to sculptors. 
Da Vinci's Last Supper, the Sistine Chapel ceiling are just two examples. Then, of course, there's the world of music. <coughs> Excuse me. Second. <clears throat> Did you know that Bach signed every piece of his music, SDG, or Sole Deo Gloria, which means what? It means glory to God alone. Seriously, guys, no Jesus, no Handel's Messiah, no Christmas music, no amazing grace. In fact, without Jesus, there would be no disciples, no John the Baptist, no Mother Teresa, no Martin Luther King, no Dietrich Bonhoeffer, no Billy Graham. Guys, there'd be none of them. So regardless, my friends, of what you think of Jesus, if Jesus had never been born, the world would be a very different place. But church, here's the good news. He did, in fact, exist. He was born, and it has literally changed our world in so many wonderful ways. And yet I'm afraid that way too often we take it for granted. In our movie, George Bailey is discouraged, and he feels hopeless and giving up on life. But then Clarence helps him to realize that he has made a positive difference on a lot of different people. Watch this clip. In jail. Ah, uh, hallelujah. Hello. George. George, Mary. darling. Where are you? George, darling. Where are you? Oh, oh George. 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 Uh, come on, George. Come on downstairs. Quick, right. they're on their way. All right. Come on. Uh, come in, Uncle Billy. Everybody in here. George. Yeah, brother, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Mary did it, George. Mary did it. She told some people you were in trouble with it. They scattered all over town collecting money. Didn't ask any questions. Just said, George, in trouble. And tell me, you spread like a spread like Another run on the bank? E.I. George, Merry Christmas. Now, don't run. Don't run. Don't you love it? I mean, that, that, that's a feel-good type of movie. It oftentimes brings tears to our eyes when we realize that he, in fact, did have an impact on so many different people. And that should encourage all of us that you and I, we also have an impact on many, many people. And we have the opportunity to be a blessing to the people that we rub shoulders with day in and day out. But I guess I wonder if we're going to be that excited over what we can accomplish, how excited should we be over the hope we have in a living Savior, right? In First Peter, it says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That, my friends, is why we celebrate Advent it's a reminder to us that Jesus came as that baby in a manger to bring us a blessed hope, to remind us that our hope is something eternal, something that we can count on. You know, in Hebrews chapter, chapter 11 is often uh, called the faith chapter, and it defines for us faith. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11, 1 is the very definition of what faith is. He says, now faith is, so he's about to tell us the definition. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Assurance of what we do not see. Listen, guys, this hope we have in Christ is more than holding your breath or trying to be optimistic. 
I love what Martin Luther King Jr. once said. He said, there is a big difference between hope and optimism. He said, optimism is the belief that circumstances are going to get better based on what we see. Therefore, it's on shaky ground and people can get disillusioned because outwardly we are all, in fact, wasting away. But the hope we have is the conviction or belief that there is another reality, another kingdom, and that kingdom exists and has existed through all eternity, and it will prevail. Guys, hear me. Just like George Bailey, I don't know about you, but I've had my fair share of failures, mistakes, and disappointments, and I'm going to guess that most of you have as well. But the good news of Christmas is that there is a God in heaven who loves us and gives us hope even when we fail or make mistakes. And the scripture tells us that he has promised to somehow work all this out for our good if we'll just trust him. You know, Romans 8, 28, for all things work together for the good of those that love God. It's a misquoted verse because people point to it and say, well, that means that everything God promises, everything in life is gonna be good. That's not what he says. What he's saying is that God works all things together for our good. So he takes this failure in life and this mistake in life and this black eye and he puts all of them together and he works them out for our good if we'll just trust him. On the other hand, if you try to build your hope or confidence on the shifting sands of earthly circumstances, then guys, you're going to live a shifting, shaky life. And if you try to build your hope on your career, you might get downsized. If you try to build your hope on your health, well, your body's eventually going to break down. And you'll certainly set yourself up for disappointment when you try to build your hope and confidence on your wealth or your material possessions. But church, listen, our hope is based on the irrevocable work and words of Jesus. In other words, our hope keeps us anchored in the current reality with an anticipation of what's to come. It's fixing our eyes on our Savior that loves us and has a purpose and plan for our life. Which is why Paul said in Philippians, he said, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. So what's Paul saying? He's saying, I have learned the secret of hope, that hope comes when we place our confidence in Christ. So guys, once again, ask yourself, what would your life be like if Jesus had never been born? I don't know about you, but when I think about that question, I think my life would feel pretty empty. More than likely, I would be chasing all kinds of worldly stuff or possessions, I'm sure I would be more competitive or greedier than I already am. I don't know if my marriage would have survived. I might have been a terrible dad, a lazy employee, a lousy neighbor. I don't really know. But this is what I do know. If Jesus had not come into my life, I would never have known the peace or the joy that comes with following Jesus Christ. Friends, there's never been a life like Jesus. There's never been a death like Jesus' death and resurrection. There's never been a love like Jesus has for you and for me. There's never been a hope like we have in our relationship with him. Guys, Jesus didn't just come to change history. He came to change you and he came to change me. In Luke chapter two, we think of as the Christmas story. It says, but the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the, I love, today a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. He came to be your Savior. He came to be your Lord, your forgiver, your redeemer, your blessed hope. Jesus is the one who says to you and all the disillusioned George Bailey's of the world. In Matthew chapter 11, he said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. 
Guys, this year as we enter into this Advent season, we need to be intentional. We need to make a decision to refocus our attention on Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, I am so very, very thankful for who you are and all that you do in our lives. You truly are the reason for this season. God, we know that if you had not been born, this world would be a very, very sad place. Our lives would feel hopeless. This Christmas, God, we just want to say thank you, God. Thank you for coming on that first Christmas. Thank you for loving us, for forgiving us, for setting us free. Thank you for being a living example of how we should live our lives. And thank you for dying in our place so that we could live. And today, God, we just want to recommit ourselves to honor you by the way that we live our lives. We love you, God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Love you, Pathway. Merry Christmas. So next week, we'll continue on with the series and uh, just talk about peace next week. I think it's going to be just a good weekend. And again, if you're guests, so grateful you're here with us today. Stop by guest services on the way out. And if you're looking for next steps, stop by next steps. Let's stand together, shall we? And let me just kind of close this off with a benediction. Romans 15, 13. It says, May the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now go with hope and with peace and with joy. We'll see you later.